I'm Scott L. Miller. It's the 16th of December, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. I had a viewer in the last few weeks write that she was afraid of, of the potentials of moving to Nicaragua and facing a long time of being gringo priced when she first arrived, that that was both intimidating, it seemed like a very large challenge to get from first arrival to no longer having to pay gringo prices most of the time. Someone will always have to pay it, of course, and that that potentially would make a move to Nicaragua or anywhere unaffordable simply because there would be such higher prices. So we're going to talk about if that's true, how you potentially avoid it, how you deal with it, and what you need to worry about right after the bump. So good morning and a happy Saturday to everybody here on the channel. Thanks for joining me. As always, it would be fantastic if you took a moment and decided to support the channel by buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. I always say that at the end of the video and there's a lot of people who only watch the first eight to 12 minutes and I wanted to get that out there. If you've never done so, that is a way that you can support the channel. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, but the question today is affording moving to Nicaragua. If you uh, have done a lot of research on the country or just watch this channel, you're probably aware that there's the concept of gringo pricing. And just real quickly, for those who are not familiar with gringo pricing, what this refers to is the general practice throughout much of the world, but it is called this because it is very common in Latin America, especially in Central America and Mexico, which borders the US where Americans and Canadians are often referred to as gringos. It's not necessarily a negative term, so don't take any offense to that by me or anyone else, especially if you're living here, being called a gringo can be a term of endearment as much as anything else. It's often just neutral, however. Um, but the idea is that there are prices that are given to locals and then Americans, Canadians, or people who are perceived as being from those places uh, will be charged more. Now, does this happen? Yeah, I mean, it's that simple. It does happen. It's very real and it happens through a lot of the world and it's not unique to Latin America by any stretch. However, it is much more common here and very accepted. Uh, partially this happens because this is a part of the world where there is negotiations for prices. So prices tend to be a lot more flexible in the first place. If you're in the United States, for example, this type of thing is hard to have happen because you have published prices and you'd have to be like, charging someone the wrong amount for something in order for it to happen in the first place. So as Americans, we don't tend to be very prepared for it because this mechanism rarely exists in our universe that we're used to, or it, it's very isolated, less than 1% of our spending. When you're here in Latin America, though, a lot of things, especially things that are very cost effective, whether it's labor or things you may be purchasing are often on flexible prices. It doesn't mean you're necessarily going into every store and negotiating the prices on common everyday items, but you might be. And a lot of the lowest prices, whether it's fruit and vegetables at the market, the meat store, uh, or your, your bakery, or you're going into the market market and you're looking for, say, plastic goods or homemade products, scarves, blankets, those sorts of things, Yes, a lot of those prices are unmarked and you're going to have a discussion about them. And that means you could end up in a situation where you're not negotiating as well as someone else or the person is simply unwilling to go as low of, with pricing with you as they would with someone else because they perceive you as having more financial resources or they simply see you as someone who deserves to pay more because you're not local and it's, it's just it's, it's an outsider's duty to pay more for products, which is not necessarily unfair. Many things in tourist zones worldwide cost more. When you can afford to be a tourist, you generally pay higher prices. That's just normal. But if you're moving here and you live here and this is your everyday life and you're suddenly in a position of potentially having to pay tourist prices all the time, you're going to run into more problems. So yes, the the concept of gringo pricing is real. The effect of it is real. It really does happen. But how much does it happen and can you avoid it? So in most cases, especially for people who are newly moved to Nicaragua or most places, you are pretty much going to be able to avoid a lot of gringo pricing because you're not going to spend a lot of time in the market. There's going to be exceptions. Someone is going to be that market bound person who's like, I am doing this. That is my thing. But that takes a lot of time and generally doesn't make a lot of sense for 
even the majority of people who are on very tight budgets. But for people who are working remotely or anything, it's essentially impossible at the beginning because it's going to take a lot of time. You don't know where the markets are. You don't know how to find your way around them. You don't have the time to negotiate on things for the tiny amount of money that you're potentially going to spend. Go shop at a grocery store. Now, in many cases, when we talk about grocery stores, everyone jumps to La Colonia or possibly La Union. These are the high end luxury grocery stores where the prices are still better in most cases than in the US or Canada but they are not Nicaraguan prices in many cases. I mean, they are the luxury Nicaraguan prices, but they're much higher than what Nicaraguans normally expect to pay for most things. It is a rare Nicaraguan or even expat who lives in Nicaragua who's going to shop at those places, and a lot of communities don't have them. They are relegated to only the larger cities, and not even all of the larger cities have them. There's lots of them in Managua, of course. Here in Leon, we have only one La Colonia. We have only one La Union. They're both in the middle of the city and everyone in the city goes to them. So what do you do? The majority of grocery stores that you could go to, whether it's a really large indoor market that's a little bit less formal or it's the major change, the chains in the country like Pali and Maxi Pali, they're going to have set prices. There's going to be no negotiation. You're not going to be gringo priced whatsoever. Loads of Nicaraguans really shop there every day for their food and the prices are excellent. Of course, you do have to pay a little bit of attention. There are a few imported luxury items that are going to cost more, but they're not gringo priced more. They're just items that are more expensive here and you don't need them. They're really never items that you need. They may be things that you really want. Oh, I just really want this American product. That's the taste of home and I'm willing to splurge on it. That's great. Go for it. But if you're on a budget, it's not something you absolutely require and you're definitely not being gringo priced. That is just the pricing at the store. And in general, Pali, Maxi Pali, La Union, those are Walmart brands. They're definitely not changing prices for different people or gringo pricing you. So those types of things, you're good. Day-to-day -day living, the electric company, the water supply, all those things, they're not going to gringo price you. They have set prices. That's how the world works. They are certainly not looking at who you are and manipulating the price for that. The government is not doing that with your taxes or with your fees and things. All those things are set schedules and, uh, and are very straightforward. So I think that the concept of gringo pricing plays into a mental picture much more than and what it impacts real people in real life. Uh, as someone who potentially could be gringo priced, absolutely, if I go to a street vendor, I expect I'm going to struggle to buy some fruit at the same price that a Nicaraguan might. Partially, less because I'm a gringo, which I am, but more because I don't know what that price should be or could potentially be. I have no basis for a good negotiation on that, and that makes it really hard for me to work someone down to a good price unless I witness someone else getting that price right in front of me. You're also not going to get gringo price in things like hotels. That's very weird. Again, they generally have published prices or the hotel is already priced, assuming there's going to be gringos there. And in most cases, you can compare online, whether that's a Airbnb or a Hilton property or just a regular hotel you found through a uh, hostel world, whatever, you're going to have those set prices that are published and you can work from that. Of course, there is the possibility you could go to a place and maybe negotiate them down a little bit. Nicaraguans are going to be better suited to doing that. They're going to know which places are more likely to give them a discount. They're going to know when places are busy or not busy. Normally, they're going to have a better position to negotiate from. Well, this room's going to be empty, or you could get my $18 up to you, right? They're, they're going to be able to bargain better. So, yes, they may get some discounts that you don't, but that's not really gringo pricing, although you could look at it that way, I suppose. The places where you're most likely to be truly impacted by gringo pricing on a day-to-day -day basis, one is taxis, and that's avoidable. Uh, in many cases, you're going to want to use taxis, uh, and in the other place, it is in your housing. When you're shopping around for a long-term rental, you may end up in a position where you're looking at houses, uh, and because they know you're not a Nicaraguan, they may try to, try to raise the price on you. And if you raise the price on a house, typically, even if it was, say, $50 a month, which in the U.S. may seem like, okay, I can live with an extra $50 a month, that's what? 1% of my rent? That would be ridiculous. But it's not that much. Here, $50 could be 25% of your rent in some cases. I mean, on extreme cases, it could be 50% of your rent, right? So um, typically, uh, uh, gringos, when we're looking for property here, just to rent, we're not looking to buy in this particular example, um, we're generally looking at places that are a little bit more expensive and already have built-in luxury price uh, accommodations. 
because even the Nicaraguans who are looking at those places are willing to spend a little bit extra because they're only looking at those because they're on the affluent side and they're looking at those kinds of places. It's rare that we actually have a lot of overlap. So gringo pricing, while it exists in housing and you do have to be careful, may not be the big factor that you imagine that it is in most cases. Getting a good deal on a house, uh, especially for rent, once you're buying, well, you're into a different category and hopefully you've been here for a while, you shouldn't be even talking about buying it until you've been here for a while. I've got lots of videos about that specifically. Go watch some of those. We're not going to dig into that here. If you're renting, this is your biggest challenge, and you can calculate your maximum losses on this pretty easily. However, it's important to point out in this uh, post that she had where she was worried about this, one of her things was she can't afford to deal with these scams. It's very intimidating because she doesn't have the budget in case something goes wrong. Well, it's also important to remember that you have to compare against the rates of cost of where you're coming from. It's hard to find many places in the United States where you could live, say, less than $500 a month. That's really hard to do. But here, living at less than $200 a month is really easy to do. So you're already potentially, under almost all circumstances, looking at cost savings that are so enormous that the idea of not being able to afford to come here, even at gringo pricing, it is still a tiny fraction of the cost of living in the United States under all but the most extreme circumstances. I've never heard of anybody who's come close to not paying just a fraction of what they paid in the U.S., except for stories where no one was willing to admit what they were saying. When people have said things were really expensive they had to have lots of money they've never been never once ever ever has someone been willing to back that up and i'm not saying that there's never been anyone scammed to that degree but there's no realistic scam to that degree people are talking about scams to in the the magnitude of a thousand percent of what normal living costs should be so it really takes some stretches of imagination to even come up with how could they have been scammed to that level. It's simply completely out of a, a, a reasonable scope, um, and which is probably why when we've asked people, okay, you claim you've been scammed to this degree, where did it go? What made you believe it? How did, what did they tell you? And they, we've never gotten feedback on that, which leads us to believe that it is us who's being scammed by those encounters. No one's being scammed that much, or someone is, but it's so rare and so avoidable. We'll talk about that. So housing is definitely the biggest challenge, though, and this is simply going to take some work. But knowing that you can get an entire two-bedroom house for $150 per month basically anywhere in the country should be enough to give you a ballpark of what to work for. And you know what your budget is going to be. Say you, you have only $100 a month, $150, $200, $250 you can go into it with this is my budget and not allow it to go above that. And yeah, you may not get as much of a house or as nice of a house as you could if you had experience. The same is true in the United States. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get a lesser apartment than if you really know how to budget hunt for housing. You could end up with a place that's fantastic at a reasonable price because you're good at it. When I lived in New York City, the people who really knew what they were doing were paying, say, a thousand a month for halfway decent places. And those of us who didn't know what we were doing were paying 3,500 or 4,000 a month for legitimately quite nice places, but we were paying so much more. Were we getting the equivalent more in value? I don't think so. We just weren't as savvy. So the same types of things happen in any market. That's not being gringo priced in most cases. It is simply just being really good at finding good value versus just being a normal shopper. When it comes to taxis, this is a spot where it's really easy to end up having to pay quite a bit more than someone who is local or knows what they're doing uh, from experience is going to pay. However, there are ways to mitigate that as well. If you're in Managua, for example, you use the app InDriver, and with this, you can set the price ahead of time. The only trick is learning what reasonable prices are before you start doing it. That takes a little bit of research, but it's not hard at all. Once you do that, and you can absolutely ask here on the channel and get some feedback at least, you'll get ballparks. And once you have that, they don't know that you're a gringo until they've already agreed to the price. It's much like Uber, so it protects you from that. So InDriver, which is also now here in Leon, but pretty new here, keeps the gringo pricing from impacting taxis. So you should be using that. Now, if you're in a market where you do have to 
to use uh, the private transportation, which could be taxis, could be capineras or whatever, could be the, the bicycle guys, uh, then there is a chance that you're going to be asked to pay more, but those tend to have very little of that because it's so easy for people to know what the prices are. And especially in most cases, uh, whether it's a capineira or a taxi, you will, maybe not your first ride, but within a few rides, share a cab with someone who is local and you will hear them get charged and you'll know what their prices are, at which point you know how much to pay. You just negotiate your price before you get into a taxi. Say, oh, I'm just making this quick run. I'm going to give you 40 quarter buzz. They say, I'm not, I want 60. You say, I'm going to give you 40. So do you want to take me or not? And then you just wait until you get a taxi who gives you a fair price. That process is what every Nicaraguan has to do too. That's not being gringo priced. They may be more uh, aggressively pricing with you because they are guessing you may not know or are guessing you may be able to pay more and to some degree you are able to pay more maybe you should pay a small amount more that's fine but there are ways to mitigate that now if you are in most of nicaragua you don't have to use private transportation there is public transportation with set pricing and they are very good about that price never changing i have never once heard of let alone had it happen to me where a gringo was charged differently for using that transportation the one thing i have heard is that with gringos they may be a little bit more aggressive of charging you for your luggage if it has to take up an extra spot whereas in nicaraguan they may be more likely to overlook it but i've never traveled with so much luggage that that came up for me or anyone i knew so it's always been second hand and to some degree you are supposed to pay for those spots i just don't know how, how often nicaraguans actually do pay for those spots versus gringos so that would take a lot of study to to see if it's a common thing to charge for it or not and who gets charged but using public transportation is already so much cheaper than taxis taxis are generally a luxury in most of the country uh, and so if you're taking buses moving around the country is so ridiculously cheap not just within a city but between cities it's all but free it's just a couple dollars to go basically anywhere in the country so if you have the time and you're on a really tight budget taxis and things that may potentially gringo price you are already something you can rule out use the public transportation, work like a Nicaraguan, and you'll find that the prices are automatically much lower and not gringo price, not subject to gringo pricing. So you've got protections there as well. If you're in a position where you have excess funds, you're a wealthy, affluent gringo, you come down here, you have an income many times or savings of many times what a Nicaraguan would have, you probably don't care at all about being gringo priced. Maybe you don't like it on a fairness level or something like that, but from an actual financial standpoint, you may not even notice. It's so minor except maybe housing. If you are on a really tight budget, then it is generally just requiring that you act a bit more like a Nicaraguan and not try to do luxury things like a, a gringo with more resources would do, and you're generally protected from the gringo pricing. You're not going to hang out in tourist areas, you're not going to hang out in enclaves, you're not going to go to tourist zones and fancy restaurants, or at least not very often, you're not going to take taxis when public transportation would do the job, maybe your first one or two rides, but once you're into the city, you're going to take the time and get to know how to use the buses or whatever system they have, and you're going to lower your prices significantly, or you're going to walk and you'll figure out where to shop, and yes, shopping at the market market is going to take you a little bit longer to know the prices and know what to look for and what to say, but for most things, let's say you're going to buy some papaya, you're going to go to Pali, you're going to see the prices there, and you know that when you go to the market, whatever the price is supposed to be, it should be less than that. Absolutely not more than that. And if it's equal or more, you simply don't buy it there. Go to Pali and get it there and not worry about it. There are unique cases where once in a while the grocery stores are cheaper than the street markets, and they're not trying to cheat you. It's just they managed to get a better price at the scale of the big markets. But generally, that's going to be a great guide. And there's very few things that you need to buy on the street that aren't available somewhere else. So it's not like you're going to be looking for an item that simply doesn't exist for you to have a comparison. And it'll take you a little while to build up that mental list of what things should cost. But until then, you have options like Pali and Maxi Pali, where the prices are very aggressive already. And this is where real Nicaraguans are shopping because they're getting good prices. Maybe not the absolute poorest of Nicaraguans who are trying to save every last penny, but we're talking really, really cost conscious. Once you have a job, 
that is full time, you pretty much go to uh, Poly for most things because you don't have the time to spend in the market at the times that it's available, get there when it's fresh, haggle, all that stuff. It takes a lot of extra time. And so they need to go to Poly. So you're looking at real prices that real working class Nicaraguans would pay on an everyday basis. So it will work out fine for you. Yes, maybe you can shave off one to 5% over time, but you're into a very tight margin that you're trying to reduce and into an area where you're trading your time and effort in order to do it, which is the same thing that Nicaraguans would have to do. Most gringo pricing and most practical gringo pricing is going to happen around luxury items, whether it's tours or assistance or things that normal Nicaraguans can't buy or have to buy under really odd circumstances where you're negotiating things. It's not going to be your cell phone. It's not going to be your television. It's not going to be your electric. It's it's the person to person transactions. And those really aren't that common. You, you may happen from time to time. You may be very annoyed that there's a very specific thing you went to buy and you paid more than someone else. But when you look at it from a budgetary standpoint, I've never known anyone where it was a significant number. You may be annoyed by it, right? It feels unfair and you remember it for days that you had to pay a dollar more for something than someone else did. But at the end of the day, over the course of a week, maybe you paid one to five dollars more. And if you compare that to the budgets that you're used to in, say, the United States or Canada or even Mexico, losing five dollars per week is only twenty, twenty-five dollars per month. And you may be looking at savings of thousands per month or at least hundreds. So that gets lost in the background. It's not that you don't still want to save that money. Every bit of savings probably matters if you're on a tight budget. But it's important to keep in scope that gringo pricing basically can never create a situation where Nicaragua does not remain the cheapest reasonable option you could be considering. And as you master the gringo pricing thing, it'll just get better and better, just not by huge margins, just by very small amounts. The last thing I want to address is the scams, because this is where potentially people lose a ton of money. And it is kind of scary, or at least scary sounding, but it's really important to remember that these scams are incredibly obvious in most cases. Uh, and there's a few rules, right? Other than dating scams, and it's easy to avoid these, don't show up in the country and just start dating the first person you meet. Take time, get to know the country. Don't rush out and start dating people. The instant that you get here, that's just really foolish anywhere. And I know there's a big temptation for that, but trust me, it's worth waiting. <laughs> Everyone I know who has had problems with dating scams did so long before they had any concept of where they were living and did so in such a way that they relied on the person they were dating to introduce them to the country. That's very dangerous because you have no no context and they know you have no context and they're in a trusted position and they can control your worldview and create some really crazy scenarios for you. So don't do that. Make sure you know the country you're living before you start dating anybody. And if you are dating someone, just be careful of when you start paying their bills or start tying things together legally. If you're in the United States, you wouldn't just meet someone and start giving them loads of money. You wouldn't just meet someone and give them access to your bank accounts. Don't do so here either. Use common sense. It doesn't make any sense that, yes, there is a temptation to help financially support people, and that's wonderful. At best, do so with some cash. Don't make commitments to it, and don't let it become a common thing where you're paying all the bills. And be aware that minimum wage is around $200 a month, so someone who needs assistance should really never be looking at more than say $200 a month because that's enough that they could be living without a job and live as someone who is working. If you are uh, like the person who told the story having to pay $2,400 per month for them to live, they're paying the equivalent of 12 full-time workers that makes no sense that that's someone who needs that money. If they needed that money, they could go out and get a job and earn plenty to live. Maybe they can't find a job, in which case $200 is more than enough because they don't have to pay to go to work. So it goes even farther and they're able to do more at home because they have more free time and they're able to look for a job or study for a job or something because they have more free time. They have a lot of benefits by doing that. So that gives you a scope like, okay, you could be scammed if you were willing to fall for it for a reasonable amount of $200 a month, but anything beyond that, you're really being scammed to a degree that makes no sense. So just have that context and you're protected there. 
Beyond that, the vast majority of scams that we talk about are from other gringos, and they mostly come in the form of either them trying to get you to buy a property that doesn't make sense. Don't talk to any gringos about buying property. Simply avoid that. Don't even talk about buying property. Come and rent and learn the environment until you've been here long enough that you can make really good decisions. Then you, it's very difficult to scam you. And the even bigger one is people approaching you with business ideas. Well, very simply, don't talk to anyone who tries to get you to invest, period. The moment they try, if they want to talk about their businesses and brag about it, fine. But if they want to get you to start putting in money, walk away. They are not your friend. They are not there to help you. It is always a scam every single time. If someone has a good business, they don't want investors. That's how it works. That is, it is completely illogical for someone who has a good business plan to want to dilute it unless they don't believe in it. Yes, there's this rare, we're not even going to go into where there could be an edge case. It doesn't make sense. And here it will never be the case. Do not invest. And if you're on a tight budget, don't be investing here. Don't be investing anywhere except for putting your money in an index fund, right? You have to have absolutely enough money to be comfortable before you can start making risky investments. That's just sound financial planning. So do not entertain any conversation. And the only thing that you have to do is not deny what I'm telling you to do. That's the majority of what people will do is they'll say, well, but I'm sure I'm the exception to this, Scott. No, you're not. The fact that you think you could be an exception makes you not the exception. Every person who is going to be the rule thinks they're the exception. That's why we have a video. You're not the exception, but that's all you have to do. Do not try to buy a house until you've been here for a few years and then only consider maybe buying a house and do not invest until you're wealthy and have extra money that you don't care about losing. That is a general rule of investing anywhere in the world for all, just at all, has nothing to do with Nicaragua. Do those things. Don't let anyone talk you into things. Don't let people beg you for a whole bunch of money and give you a sob story. It's sad that people may want money. Yes, they may actually want money, but you don't have excess money to give them. Don't give it away. That's it. Those are the scams. They're all able to be enumerated and listed and easily avoided. And there's really no like, I wonder if this is, no. No one is going to legitimately try to sell you a house when you first get here. That's not legitimate because you haven't been here long enough for someone to give you the, the only advice they should give you legitimately is, whoa, you don't know enough to buy a house yet. Don't do that. Or look at houses, but don't consider buying them. Just look because it's fun. Sure. Do not invest at all, period. And don't talk to anyone who's trying to get you to invest there. Now you know how to avoid the scams. Any scam that may happen is because you wanted it. And some people really enjoy being scammed. I do not know why, but it is a thing some people love and they seek it out. If that's your form of entertainment, that's fine. But be aware, it's a very expensive form of entertainment and that's what it is. You have the tools to not be scammed on any real scale. The last thing that I want to bring up is this concept of, of gringo pricing and getting scammed and all those things pretty much exist only in tourist areas. That's not 100% true, but it is generally true. San Juan del Sur, Granada, they're going to have so much more of this than anywhere else. Managua, Leon, we're going to have some of it. But if you start getting further afield, and if you're on a tight budget, you probably should be, then you pretty much have these things drop off. If you're in Matagalpa, Esteli, Chinandega, Hinotega, Hinotepe, Didiamba, uh, any number of smaller cities, the chances that you're going to get gringo priced, it's still going to happen, but it's going to go way down. Even in those little fruit markets on the street, they're not going to try to gringo price you because you're the only one. You're not part of a stream of gringos who are coming through town and you catch them off guard. They're not sure where you came from. And the fact that you're there probably means you're not a tourist, so they don't want to potentially give up a customer. So all of that works in your favor. And the cost of living in general goes way down outside of the tourist areas too. So you're already saving more money, which is what probably should drive you to most of those places in the first place. Not in every case, but in many. And lastly, the scams are mostly perpetrated by gringos in tourist areas on new arriving uh, gringos. And I'm going to repeat this somewhere else, but I want to say it now because I heard this recently in a conversation and it's one of the best things I've ever heard. 
San Juan del Sur's economy functions like one giant pyramid scheme of the old gringos who came into town, got sucked into the pyramid scheme long ago, and now prey on the new people moving into town to fall for their scams and build up the pyramid. And that really is how it feels, and that is really how it operates when you get down there and witness it. Nearly every single thing that you see going on is a small group of people who have gotten stuck in town are either just running some kind of businesses or have a long tail investment and this is what they do and they look for the newbies coming into town whether they're newly moved in or they're just tourists that are stopping by and may get sucked in and they know they don't have the context and they don't have the wherewithal and they don't have the savviness and they go after them and try to sell them a property or get them to invest in a business or whatever that is very true and it exists almost exclusively in san juan del sur a little bit in Granada, maybe a little bit on Ometepe, but very little. And here in Leon, you're really not going to see it. Sure, you're going to find people who want to sell you a house or a bridge in the desert or whatever, but it's few and far between and it's very isolated. It isn't a pyramid scheme. It isn't a whole bunch of people with different layers that have been there over time. It's just individuals trying to sell some property that they're stuck with or whatever. So if you do just a few things, I think it's easy to see that one, if, if you're really on a tight budget, you can't afford not to be here. The fact that you're not here means you have extra money to play around with. The sooner you get here, the sooner you'll get cost savings and a lot of it. I don't care who you are or where you're coming from, it's going to save you money here. I have seen people who have not saved money here, but they were throwing money away like crazy, buying three meals every time they went out. They saw the low prices and lost their minds and started throwing money around like crazy, buying everyone drinks, buying three meals and just picking from different ones because they didn't want to do more complex ordering, uh, only going to fancy restaurants, buying all kinds of things they didn't need really quickly, renting uh, big houses when they didn't need to, all outside of their budget. If it was within their budget, who cares? But it wasn't, and they just lost control and started spending like crazy. As long as you're spending logically, as long as you're buying only what you need, I guarantee the cost savings here are going to be significant. And as long as you're following the guidelines that we've given you on this channel, the scams are not a real risk. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to ask more questions, get down there, ask, have your concerns. What do you think about the content here? Is there something I've missed? Let me know. Let's talk about it. What are your, I'm going to post the original question. I want to know your feedback you who asked the question what do you what are your real concerns what do you think could happen to you because i it blows my mind anytime someone says i don't think i can afford nicaragua something's wrong because there's no way it's not cheaper than where you are how can you not afford nicaragua how can you afford not to be here if you think this is a challenge financially and it could be a challenge financially some people just are on that tight of a budget but the tighter your budget the more you need to be here not the less you want to be here right? That can't be overstated. This is how you save money unless you have some extra thing. Well, I have to fly to Thailand every six months. Well, flights from here to Thailand are pretty expensive. So that could, but if it's just living, right, then this is, this is going to be cheaper. Um, and, and uh, tell your friends and family about the show, post on social media, and I will see all of you tomorrow.